Welcome, everybody. Good morning to all of you in the room. To everybody in Kitchener, I hope, uh, hope you're excited this morning. Anybody that may be in Westside or watching online, this is a really big Sunday. It feels like a really big weekend, actually. My name's Pete, by the way. I'm one of the pastors here. I always say that knowing that most of you are like, of course, you're Pete. Get on with it. But some of you, I know if you're going to listen to me, you want to know like at least what's, what's your name, dude? So my name's Pete. But this is a big weekend, and it's a big weekend. Uh, one, we had a big wedding yesterday for Pastor Caleb, who's a pastor at the Kitchener campus and leads worship there. People in Kitchener, you know Caleb very well, got married to Sarah, who was also on staff here. So that was big. And then this morning, we are having Baptism Sunday. Where I think, uh, let me get the number, I think it's 13, 13-ish people are being baptized this morning. So not all in this service, but there's this service, there's Kitchener service, there's the service after this. And so it's a big morning, 13 people being baptized. And so my job is to just say a little bit about baptism and what it means and then get out of the way because we're going to celebrate this morning. Does that sound good? Yeah, it's exciting. So what... What is baptism? What, what is baptism? We, we speak on baptism many times a year, and it's a bit of a challenge to be like, say something fresh. Don't just say the same thing every time, which might happen. Please forgive me if that happens. But what is baptism? Well, if you're, if you're completely unaware, what you're going to see is a, is a stream from the pond just outside here, and you're going to see people in the water, and they're going to give a confession of their faith that they have become followers of Jesus that they have turned from a life of sin and decided to follow Jesus, and they are going to be dunked underwater and brought back up above the water. That's what's going to physically happen. You're going to watch that happen. But there's a deeper meaning to all of that, of course. And that's what I want to talk about. What is, what is actually happening? What is this declaration that they're making, and why does it involve this water? And to talk about what it means... I want to go to a strange story in the Bible. You know those parts of the story, right? When you're reading the Bible, you're like, oh, this story makes sense to me. Then there's other stories you read and you go, that's weird. I'm going to have to wait to hear a sermon on that someday to maybe try to make sense of it. We're going to look at one of those stories. And we're going to go to the book of Matthew. And it's at the end of the book of Matthew. And it's right at the moment when Jesus is dying on the cross. Jesus is dying on the cross for the sins of the world. On the cross, he's displaying the love of God to all of us, that the love of God would come down from the heavenly throne and die for us. This is what the love of God looks like. And then Matthew tells us this, this strange thing happens in this moment. He describes it like this. He says, when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. And the tombs broke open. And the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. How many of you are like, what? That happened? And then, and then what, where did those people go? What happened? They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When I first read this, I was like, that's not in, that wasn't always in the Bible. That got added. Because I, we don't talk about that a lot. That, that at, at the death of Jesus, some people in tombs that were dead were resurrected, and then they went into the city, and people saw them. What, a, Matthew, Matthew, what are you doing? Why are you telling us this? What's going on with this story? Okay, first, the ordering of this story is, is kind of interesting, because he says that, that when Jesus died, that's when they were resurrected. But it wasn't until Jesus was resurrected a couple days later that then they went into the holy city. Which if you're really reading this like, like literally, like it's got to be as literal as possible, that means that they were resurrected and then just chilled in their tombs for a couple days waiting to go into the holy city. Which I don't know that Matthew's overly concerned with those chronological details. And in fact, the early church writers often, when they're writing, they see the death and resurrection of Jesus as one event. 
And so they talk about it as if it's one event. And so it's almost like Matthew's telling this story and he's merged these two events. It's like when Jesus died, people rose up out of their graves and then they went into the city and people saw them. So, so it's kind of like chronological details that make, make us like, this is a little bit weird until we read other writers and we go, oh, okay, they see the death and resurrection as combined. But also the, another question emerges is like, like, what comes after verse 53? Well, Matthew doesn't tell us anymore. Because don't you want to know, like what happened when grandma showed up for dinner and, and grandma's been dead for 10 years? Matthew's not overly concerned with this for some reason. We would love to know. What happened to these people? Did they go, it was just like a weekend thing. We showed up for dinner. Then they went back to their tombs. How much longer do they live? Are they still living among us? Like what? Matthew, he doesn't tell us. He doesn't tell us what happened afterwards, which leads to the question, always the question, Matthew, why did you tell us this then? It seems like it's a strange detail. Here's why I think Matthew told us this detail. Because he wants us to see the death and resurrection of Jesus as an event that creates a ripple effect. That, that the death and resurrection of Jesus is like an explosion on the planet, a good explosion, an explosion of life. And that from that moment, that explosion of life, life started rippling out like a shock wave that started infusing the dead creation with this new life. There's an order to, to what happens. He says, he says, what's the first thing that happened? The curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. The curtain was a representation of the separation of God's space and human space. It was like a barrier keeping heaven's space and human space separated. And the first thing that happens at the death of Jesus is that that is torn in two. And it's like the barrier that was holding back heaven gets ripped in half and then heaven starts flooding into the earth and it shakes the whole earth and rocks start splitting apart and tombs start bursting open and people who are dead start coming back to life. I think this is what Matthew wants us to see is that this event, this thing that Jesus does, his death and resurrection, it's not just about him. It's not just a story about how one guy who was God in the flesh came and died and rose again. It's about how that event has a ripple effect and is inviting all of us to experience the same thing. Which, when we're talking about Christianity, helps us get the story right. It helps us get the purpose right. What is this whole story leading to? Where's this whole story going that the Bible tells us that Christianity is all about? Sometimes the story gets hijacked. It gets hijacked by shows like The Simpsons. It gets hijacked by culture. And we start to get images of, oh, this Christian thing, this Jesus thing is all about how one day far away we can go somewhere after we die. And this story is not about someplace far, far away after we die. It's about here and now. And when Matthew tells his story, he makes sure that we know this isn't about Jesus did something and then we wait for some other time. He's like something happened and a shock wave rippled out and started affecting the whole earth. Heaven started invading. Life started to be infused into the old dead creation. This Christian story has never been about somewhere later only. Of course, there's a later. Of course, we have a hope for later. But it's also a hope that things here and now change. That God is here and now working to heal his fallen creation. With my kids, I've always tried to correct this because I grew up thinking that this was all about make a transaction with God, get some like life insurance, and then when you die, you don't have to worry about what's gonna happen. I kind of grew up with that narrative and I've tried to correct that with my kids and I think I've got it because I've noticed that they, they phrase their questions about Christianity and church and Jesus in a unique way that I've never really heard before. And I hope that maybe you could do this with your kids or people that you're discipling. I've taught them about how the end hope of Christianity is not far, far away, but is the hope that there will be a new earth, a new heavens and a new earth, that God would heal what, what was broken, that God would heal what's broken in each one of us, 
and heal what is broken in his creation. And so the goal, where this whole thing is going, is a new creation where everything good comes back. And so you know what, when my kids, how they phrase their questions, they'll say things like, so dad, in the new creation, and, and they used to like say it really long. They'd be like, dad, like after, after Jesus comes back and we're all resurrected and then there's the new creation and then they'd ask their question and they'd be like, will dogs be there? And I'll be like, I think so. I mean, I think everything good in the original creation will be in the new creation. And so they'll say things like, well, do you think that in the, new crea- in the new creation, do you think we'll be able to fly? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe we could hope for it, but I don't know. There's no reason to think that we could fly, but it'd be neat. Put it on the wish list. Something to look forward to, maybe. And they'll say, so, they, so they said, what, in the new creation, sometimes they'll, say, sometimes they'll say, Dad, when we come back, and that's their language of when we are resurrected, and living in the new creation. And then they ask questions. And they'll, they'll ask questions. And, and my, my middle son, Zeke, uh, who is the most inquisitive and, and uh, funny one that I tell the most stories about. And I got to figure out a way to tell stories about the other ones because he's getting too big of a head, quite frankly. Uh, and he's like, Dad, any stories about me today? Am I, am I rescuing your sermon from the pit of boredom? And uh, no, he doesn't say that. That's how I hear it. Uh, he, uh, so he'll, he'll ask questions and, you know, like we'll be driving by like a graveyard and he's like, so dad, like all those people were coming back, all the people under those stones, like coming back. I'm like, yeah, man, like Jesus is going to resurrect us. Like it's going to happen. He's like, I don't know. And he kind of like, I'm like, I don't know. I don't think we're coming back. I'll be like, well, it's a, and, and even as he wrestles with it, I'm so happy that he's wrestling with the right questions. He's wrestling with the right narrative. He's trying to imagine what will it eventually be like in the new creation. And I hope that as he gets older, he'll realize that our job is to start to participate as if the new creation was already here. Because that's what it means to be a Christian is that somehow the spirit of God is working and we are to participate and live as if this new creation is already beginning to show up. The seeds of it have been planted and it's starting to bloom. It's not fully here, but we can start to participate as though it is hoping, trusting that one day it will fully be here. Now, what does all this have to do with Baptism Sunday? Very simply, on Baptism Sunday, we are declaring, that what happened to Jesus happened to us. Notice past tense, happened. It's not gonna happen when they go in the water. It already happened. They already placed their trust in Jesus. But what happened to Jesus, that he died and rose again, people are going to get into the water today to declare that what happened to Jesus happened to them. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, says it this way. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. People today are going to be baptized. They are going to be put under the water, which is them identifying with the death of Jesus. And then they'll be raised up out of the water, which is them identifying with the resurrection of Jesus so that they too may live a new life, a new life that begins, well, it began when they first believed in Jesus. So they are declaring what happened to Jesus happened to them. They're declaring that they, they believed the message of King Jesus. They put their trust in him, that his death paid the penalty for their sins. And ever since that day, they've been experiencing a shockwave running through their lives. It's as if if the barrier to heaven has been ripped open and it's been flooding into their life and it's been shaking their whole life. It's been breaking parts of their life. Parts of their life have been like dying off as they step into this new life. It's as if they were dead in a tomb and Jesus called their name and they have run out of that tomb. It's as if they were lost And now they have been found. That is what we are going to hear from people out at the pond today as they are baptized. That what happened to Jesus happened to them. And as I thought about this this week, I realized that the word identify has become become like a hot button word in our culture. 
It's big. You know what I noticed too? When I go like this, this is like a protective, like protecting my bowels. And so it means I'm about to say something uncomfortable, like, like subconsciously. And so I try not to do it. But then I put my hands behind my back, which means it seems like I'm hiding something. And so it's always, there's a subconscious thing going on. But, but if you ever see me go like this, you're like, oh, Pete's on, he's guarding himself because he's about to say something and then expect to get struck with a sword or something. Anyways, we won't include that in the next version of this sermon. That's just for you. Uh, the word identify has become a, a trigger word in our culture. And ever since I've ever heard about baptism, I've, I've heard use the word identify. That in baptism, we decide to identify with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we live in a world today where the prevailing idea is that you can identify as whatever you want. You can identify as, what, as whatever you want. <laughs> and, and as I thought about that this week, I thought, I guess that's true. We're free to identify as whatever we want. But what you're going to see out at the pond today and what you're going to see on stage in Kitchener today is people that given the full range of options, I could identify as whatever I want. I could make anything I want to be the foundation of my life. People given the full buffet have said, I choose Jesus. I choose to identify as a follower of Jesus and to be identified primarily, first and foremost, as one who has died with him and been raised to new life with him. For those of you, I know that there's people in this room, I know there's people watching in Kitchener and online, you are wrestling with this, these ideologies about, about I can identify, what should I identify with? Let me tell you. The best thing, the best decision you will ever make is to decide, I will choose to identify with the death and resurrection of Jesus. And you don't have to just take my word for it. You're going to hear stories this morning of people who have made that decision and are beginning to walk in this new life. And just before we go out to the pond this morning, I wanted to impress upon you that if you are a believer in Jesus, if you would call yourself a follower of Jesus, then next step is get baptized. There is a command from Jesus to be baptized. If you believe, then you get baptized. There is a sequence that always happens in the Bible. People believe and then they get baptized. At Pentecost, 3,000 people believed and then they got baptized. Paul and Silas in the jail, the jailer gets converted. He believes, he gets baptized. It says his whole house gets baptized. He calls everybody, everybody go, go, go get baptized. The Ethiopian eunuch, he's riding in a cart. Someone, Philip comes up and converts him and he's like, oh, there's some water, I wanna get baptized right away. If you are a believer in Jesus, then the next step for you is to be baptized. And, and it's funny how many people I meet that will say something to the effect of, well, like, do I need to get baptized? Like, meaning, like, do I need it to be saved? And first of all, I think that's the wrong question. Like, technically, no. Technically, no, you don't need it to be saved. But if you're asking those questions, I think you've lost the plot of what we're talking about. Because you're, you're basically trying to create this new type of Christian that is saved, but not a disciple. I'm looking for, is that an option? That's basically what you're asking me when you're like, I believe in Jesus, I'm just not going to get baptized. You're basically saying, I'd like to be saved, but not be a disciple. I'm looking for the lowest bar version of Christianity. I'm looking for the least. Isn't that, isn't that a weird thing to say? It's kind of like you don't trust that God knows what's best for you. That when God commands you to do something, that his commands are always good and for us. And so if you've been on that fence of like, I'm, I believe, I don't, in baptism, I don't need to believe to be saved, or to be baptized to be saved, like, it is, it is the next step in your obedience. The goal is to be a follower, not just someone who made a decision one day. And so if, you, if you're hearing me say this and you're a little bit uncomfortable, you're, you're doing the little of this, 
then, then I really encourage you, like, get in touch with me, get in touch with Jeff, get in touch with Pastor Tim at the Kitchener campus. We would love to, to answer any questions that you have and get you signed up for the next time we have Baptism Sunday in September. And now, Jesus, at his death and resurrection, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. Heaven started to invade the earth. The earth shook. Rocks were split open. Tombs were split open. And people started coming out of their graves. That has happened to the people out at the pond today. And we're going to hear their stories in just a minute. But before we do, let me pray for them. God, we pray for the people that are going to be baptized this morning. We thank you for what you have done in their lives. We pray that, that your spirit would be so tangibly present, that they would feel just an extra sense of your presence, of you speaking over them. I, there's my child, whom I love. God, for those of us who have already been baptized, may we watch this and remember our own baptism. Remember our own inclusion in your family. Remember how, how we were lost, but are now found. How we were dead, but are now alive again. And God, for anybody who's, who's watching and wondering and thinking, we pray for understanding. We pray that all of this would somehow make sense and that the mysterious work of your spirit would call them Call them to discipleship. Call them to baptism. We pray these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Amen.